Hello and welcome back to the first of the Moderate Security Level Chapters. In the Moderate Level Chapters, we will be focusing on your hardware to make sure that it's as current and up-to-date as possible. We'll look at your cable and DSL modems to make sure that they're secure. We'll help you to improve the security of your email settings and passwords as well. Then we'll review some important home networking basics such as TCP IP, DHCP, and DNS, which help everything work smoothly and securely. As with previous chapters, some of what I cover will be informative and is designed to make you more familiar with concepts and terms surrounding your PC and home network. Other sections will be more hands-on, where we make changes to further secure your environment. Let's jump right in and get started with Chapter 1 of the Moderate Security Level. First, let's look into the device drivers that your PC relies on and how you can make sure that they're updated and providing the best function and security for your system. I talked about device drivers a bit in previous chapters. Remember that a device driver is a small piece of software that helps your computer components communicate with Windows while ensuring that all of its features and security work is designed. Recall that I mentioned that some devices such as webcams or new printers may include a disk that you install before you attach them so the new drivers are in place and Windows can recognize them. Windows relies heavily on device drivers to get the most out of all the components installed in your system. Your display, your keyboard, your mouse, your printer, and every other device attached to your PC uses the device driver specifically written for Windows 7. Hardware inside your PCs is no different. Your video card, which makes your video display work, your network card, your USB ports, sound card, and everything else relies on device drivers. These drivers basically sit between the Windows 7 operating system and all the devices to ensure that they speak the same language and understand the same features and commands. Why should you care about these invisible and technical components of your computer? Well, just like keeping your applications up to date so that Windows can work well with them, your devices also have to be updated by keeping their drivers current. When Windows gains new functionality, fixes known problems, or adds new security features, it may need to communicate some of this new information to your PC's devices. Sometimes your drivers will be out of date, which might disable new functionality and potentially improved security. There are two types of updates to consider when updating your PC's device drivers. When you purchase a PC from a mainstream manufacturer, they'll include all the drivers for all the installed components, of course. To check for updates in the future, you'd visit your PC manufacturer website, typically in the support area, and you'd find any updated drivers clearly listed for your particular model. They'll come with any installation programs necessary, so that when you download the device driver updates, they can be automatically updated and installed. Typically, these installation programs will also check the current device driver to make sure the version you're installing is in fact newer and better than the one that's already installed. We'll take a look at a few manufacturer websites just to give you a look at what I'm talking about in a minute. What's important is that you understand the concepts, know where to look for the updates, and take the time to regularly check for these updates. If you have a problem with the device and it's not working properly, it's always a good idea to run through this process and make sure the device drivers for this faulty component are current. The second possibility is that you have a new device that you've installed on your PC or you're attaching to it externally and you want to make sure the device drivers for it are current. In this case, you must visit the manufacturer website for that particular device. Again, looking for the support or download section and locating your gadget. Then check the device driver version or date to see if it's been updated since you purchased it. Once located, the installation process is similar to the PC manufacturer's process. You would download and run the installation program provided to install the new device driver. So those are the two primary groups of drivers that you need to deal with and keep current. Original PC gear and the components you install on your own. I'm going to demo a couple of things right now. First I'll show you how to find the devices and locate their driver date and versions using the Windows 7 Device Manager. And then I'll jump on the internet and visit Dell, HP, and Logitech websites just to show you how to find driver updates for PC manufacturers as well as aftermarket components. You can always check on the date and version for drivers currently installed on your Windows 7 PC. Here's how to check what's currently installed on your PC for each of your device drivers. You can always compare these versions to what's available on the internet and see if you are current. Of course you'll need administrative privileges to perform these steps. 
All right, so first I'm going to go to the Start button. And then I'm going to go to Computer, and I'm going to right mouse click, and I'm going to select Manage. What we should see is the main computer management screen. On the left window pane, you want to select Device Manager. Now on the right, you see a tree listing of all the devices installed in your Windows PC, grouped by type. For this example, I'll click on Display Adapters to get all the details. Here you'll see the make and model of the video card that's installed in my PC. Yours may be different, but that's where your display adapter driver can be found. Now I'm going to right mouse click on the display adapter and select Properties. On the General tab are the basic details about your display adapter. I'm going to go ahead and click on the Driver tab. Here are all the details and options for the specific software device driver for this specific hardware device, which is our display adapter. You will see who created the driver, its date, and its version number. This is the information that you'll need to compare to what's currently available on the Internet to determine if your driver is up to date. There are other choices here that provide some more detail and also allow you to update the driver. However, I recommend that unless you're very comfortable with these options, you make no changes from this screen. Simply check here to locate your current dates and versions. Okay, so that's how you find out what's currently installed in your PC system. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Let's say you have a major manufacturer PC such as a Dell or HP system. I'm going to go ahead and hit their web support site and look for driver updates. As we run through this demonstration, you'll see that the device drivers are dependent on which operating system you're running. They're designed for a specific operating system, which in our case is Windows 7. Further, we need to know whether we're running the 32 or 64-bit version of Windows 7, as the drivers will differ. The quickest way to determine which of these versions you're running on your PC is to look at your computer properties. All right, I'm going to go down and click the Start button again. Then I'm going to go up to Computer. Then I'm going to right mouse click and choose Properties. This brings up the basic information screen. If you check under the System section, you'll see the system type is listed. In my case, I'm running the 32-bit version of Windows 7. Keep in mind which version your system is running to always make sure you download the correct updates. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Now I'm going to launch Internet Explorer. And for example, let's jump on the HP site. I'm just going to hp.com. I'm going to select Support and Drivers. And of course, these websites change very often in terms of look and feel, but you'll always see these main options. Support and Drivers. It wants to know whether I'm going to download drivers and software. That's correct. I'm going to select Download. Then it wants to know my specific PC product name. It's very important that you put the exact model number at whichever manufacturer site that you're using. I'll click Go. Okay, now as expected, it wants to know which version of my operating system. So I'm going to go ahead and say Microsoft Windows 7 32-bit. Click Next. All right, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down and see what we have. We have several pieces of software available. I'm going to go ahead and drop down drivers. And I'm going to go further down and you see that there's drivers for the video card, drivers for the sound card, wireless networking, and all the other installed components. All right, now you do notice here that you have the driver date and version. This is the date and the version that you compare to the information that you found on your system using the device manager a minute ago. If these are newer, you may want to install them. All right, I'm going to go ahead and quit. Go back to my home page. Let's do the same thing with Dell. A little bit different navigation, but basically the same process. I'm going to go ahead and look at For Home. Then go down to Support Drivers and Services. 
Then I'm going to select drivers and downloads. Now I'm going to look at choosing a model. Select desktops. I'll go down and pick one of the newer type desktops. Let's say a studio desktop. And then how about a 540? Say confirm. Okay, so we're looking for drivers for our new Studio Desktop 540. I'm going to go down and select the operating system. Now in this case, Windows 7 64-bit is the only option available. That's because they must have only offered that 64-bit operating system for this model. If they did offer the 64 and the 32-bit, you'd see them both listed. So I'm going to go ahead and select 64-bit for this example. All right, now I'll scroll down. And here's all the different files. I'll pick audio. Again, the Realtek driver for audio. Gives us the date and the version. Same situation that we saw on the HP site, just for the Dell PC. All right, I'm gonna close that. And that's an example of two of the major manufacturers in terms of finding the device drivers that came along with your PC. Okay, so that's how you find the entire suite of drivers for all the built-in equipment your PC came with from the manufacturer. Now let's take a look at how we find driver updates for all the gear that you may have purchased on your own. For this example, I'll assume that we have a Logitech webcam installed and you want to make sure that your drivers are current. So I'm going to go ahead and hop onto the Logitech website. All right, here we are. We're going to go ahead and select support, product support. I will select a product type. Let's do webcams. And then further select a product. I'll choose HD webcam C310. Over on the right hand side, I'll scroll over, download installation software drivers updates and more. As always, it wants to know what operating system we're running. I'll say Windows 7. Finally, it gives a selection for a file. So you see the option is to download the entire software package slash installer. This is common for many manufacturers so that you can make sure that you have a fully automated program available to update your drivers and software. Some devices may actually list the device driver alone, but many won't and they'll list a package like this. Either way, you can download the latest and install if your current driver is out of date. You may want to download this and save it before you install it, take a look at the notes associated with it, and then check the version to compare with your installed version using the steps that we just covered a few minutes ago using the device manager. So I'll close this out and get back to the desktop. So to review real quick, we did a few important things here. We covered how to find the current versions of all your device drivers, then how to locate and download updated versions if they're available from your manufacturer. I'm hoping this gives you a solid background of what device drivers are, why they're important, and how to make sure your PC stays current with the latest drivers at all times. Remember to visit this process at least every few months to keep things up to date. Next, I want to talk about further securing your PC-based email system. Remember from previous chapters that email is open and completely unsecure for a number of reasons. I use the term PC-based email to describe email where you have an email client program such as Outlook installed on your system. Although web-based email where you use your browser and access email from the internet website is equally unsecure, this section applies to client-based email like Outlook or email systems that are often referred to as POP or SMTP mail. First, it's important to do a quick review of how email works so I can explain how we might make it safer. When your email program is running, it connects to your email provider server somewhere on the internet. It uses a language known as Simple Mail Transfer Protocol or SMTP to have this conversation with your email server. For example, if you use the email account provided by your internet service provider, then they provide the settings and account information that you need to connect and use their email. If you use AT&T for your internet connection, 
then you're using the email that they provided for your account. You're also connecting to their AT&T SMTP server when your PC sends or receives mail. This email setup would include the server names and the user ID and password assigned to you for your email account. This means that every time your email client connects, it sends your email user ID and password across the internet to this server for authentication and then sends and receives your mail. This process of logging in and sending or receiving mail is unsecure unless your email client is configured to connect using SSL, which is a secured language. SSL is the same protocol or language that we talked about in prior chapters when we looked at HTTPS for secure websites. If your email provider allows it, you can secure your email connection using SSL. To find out, you'd need to investigate their offering either on their website or by contacting their customer service. I'd vote for a call to their support line so you can get the answer, as well as all the details needed to configure your email client for SSL security. We'll review the configuration process in a minute, but only your service provider can provide the details that you'll need for this configuration that's specific to their servers. Now you need to be careful to understand exactly what this means and what it might not mean. Using SSL security for your email client means that when your client connects to your provider's server to log in or to send and receive email, those transactions are secure. But as soon as their mail server forwards your message to the destination server of the person that you're sending the mail to, that communication is no longer secure and open to the public. Still, using SSL for that first leg of communication between your PC and your email provider brings with it great security improvement because this first leg of the email trip is when the account user ID and password are transmitted. There are also a number of other hacks that the bad guys can try on you once they know your credentials and other information from that initial conversation. So, SSL of your email client can be a very important step to further secure your environment and protect your information. For my example, I'm going to be using Outlook 2007 as my email client, and I'll step you through the configuration of an SSL or secured mail connection. Remember that exact settings may differ from your email provider, so you need to find documentation or leverage assistance from your provider before making these changes. Also, if you're using a different email client than I am for my example, then you'll need to locate your email account settings for your email program and then the location for configuring your connections to use SSL. Most email clients support SSL, and it should be simple to locate. So here are the items that my email service provider presents in their documentation for using an SSL email client. They provided the POP or incoming server name, the SMTP or outgoing server name, as well as which ports each will use, and of course, the type of security encryption, which in this case is SSL. Understanding SSL, communication ports, or any of the details here goes beyond the scope of this system but it's important to recognize these as email settings that you'll need to have and will pop into your email client configuration screens. Let's go ahead and look at the Outlook 2007 email program to see how the configuration looks and what we need to do to set up SSL security email. Okay, so this is the main Outlook screen. I'm gonna to select Tools. Then I'm gonna go down to Account Settings. From account settings, we see a screen that lists all of my current email accounts. I'm going to go ahead and highlight the email account that we want to secure. And now I'm going to click Change. You see your existing email account settings here, which should be fine if your email is currently working. It's possible that the incoming and outgoing server names may change when using the secure SSL mail method, but in most cases they won't change. My provider does not make changes to any of these settings when using SSL security. So I'll look for the More Settings button right over here and then select it. Here's where Outlook allows you to configure your existing email client to use SSL security. I'm going to select the Outgoing Server tab. In order to configure for a secure SSL email connection, you'll need to authenticate or log on to your email provider server. The My Outgoing Server Requires Authentication checkbox should be selected. The next radio button selection tells this new secure connection to use the same credentials as that you used to log in for your email system previously. Unless specifically instructed to use a different username and password, 
this radio button should be selected. If your email provider did supply a different set of login credentials specifically for SSL secured connections, then select the Log on Using Radio button and fill in the username and password accordingly. Go ahead and select the Remember Password option as well, so that you don't have to enter these credentials every time you run email. The last two settings for requiring SPA authentication and logging in before sending are typically not required, but again, you have to refer to the instructions from your email provider. Now I'm going to go click on the Advanced tab. Here's where we will assign the port numbers provided to me by my email provider for the incoming and outgoing servers. Then make sure there's a checkbox next to the SSL requirement option. And then finally drop down the encryption type and select SSL. Again, per the instructions from my email provider, we need to make sure that you select the method they recommend. Okay, that's all there is to it. I'll click OK on each of these screens and get back to our main email account options screen. From the main screen, I can click the Test Settings button, which will use the settings I just entered and attempt to connect to the email server securely using SSL to log in and then finally send a test email to confirm send and receive are working. If you receive any errors when running this test, then you need to go back and make sure the information was configured exactly as required by your email provider. Once correct, this test should run clean and you can click Next until you complete the configuration. All right, now we're back. We'll go ahead and close. Now you have SSL secured email authentication for this email account. Remember, if you have additional email accounts with this or other providers, then you need to go back, select them from the email account list, and configure each accordingly. I'll go ahead and close out Outlook for now. Okay, great. So now we've taken a big step towards further strengthening your email security. Now whenever you launch Outlook or other email client, the connection from your PC out to the internet to your email provider servers will be secure, and your authentication ID and password, as well as other important email account related information, will be safe from the bad guys. Always remember that this step simply secured the first hop onto the internet between your PC and your trusted email provider systems. Once your email jumps off of their systems to locate its final destination, it will again be out in the open and completely insecure. But none of your important authentication information is part of your email message once it leaves your provider's servers, so you're safe as long as you don't include important information in the body of your email. We covered that previously, but I just wanted to throw it in one more time. Sometimes we're thinking about the recipient or what we're typing so much that we forget that once sent, your email is open for the world to see. Next in the series, I want to review another type of system update that you should be aware of. Most all intelligent electronic devices operate from a set of instructions that are built into their hardware. These instructions could be compared to software that you run on your PC, except these instructions reside on a chip inside and not on the hard drive or other storage device. This is commonly referred to as your PC BIOS, which stands for Basic Input Output System, or may be called firmware, which is typical for devices like cell phones, MP3 players, or other components you connect to your PC, including your DSL cable or satellite modem. Generally speaking, the BIOS is like the brain for the hardware inside most of these devices. By most devices, I'm speaking of gadgets that have a processor and memory inside and typically have some type of display or way to interact with it. As with many of these more technical discussions, there's no real need to understand the full workings of a PC BIOS or device firmware in order to meet the goals of securing your system. But as always, it is important to understand these principles and how you can make sure that all your important gear is properly configured. What these BIOS chips and firmware instructions do is tell the PC or other device what to do when you flip on the power button. When you first power on your PC or other device, you may see a series of startup activities on the screen. Maybe you see the Dell, IBM, or HP logo. On a handheld device, maybe you see a counter or progress bar that comes up. This is the BIOS chip taking control and running its embedded software or firmware. It's running checks to make sure the hardware is functioning properly and then getting ready to run the operating system that's loaded on it. You may see a message on the screen that tells you what keyboard key to strike during this initial startup process so that you can run the system setup, which is also known as the BIOS or CMOS setup. In my example, you would hit the F2 key. 
but your choices will differ depending on which PC make and model you're running. I'm sticking with the Dell examples only to be consistent. Setup is a program that's embedded in the BIOS chip that allows you to change fundamental settings of how your computer hardware functions. Tweaking these settings goes well beyond the scope of this system, but I mention it because you should know that it exists and because you may be able to see what version of BIOS is currently installed on your PC system from this setup menu. If you do run the BIOS or CMOS setup, don't make changes to it. Simply read the screens to see if you can find the date and version of your current BIOS firmware, then exit immediately. Improper configuration of these setup options could cause unpredictable behavior and adverse PC performance. After the normal startup messages are complete on your PC, you'll eventually see Windows begin to load. So in effect, Windows sits on top of the BIOS and firmware within your PC, and these firmware instructions help Windows to communicate with the other chips and the hardware in your system. As always, the question arises. Why should you care about the BIOS and the firmware stuff? If you guess that BIOS and firmware have security and stability implications for your PC and other electronic devices, you would be correct. Ensuring that these built-in instructions are current and up-to-date is another important component to maintaining a stable, consistent, and safe system. On occasion, new BIOS chip firmware will be created by the manufacturer in order to take advantage of new features or fix problems from prior versions. Very similar to device drivers, these BIOS firmware updates come from one of two places, either the PC manufacturer or the manufacturer of the equipment that you've added to your PC later. Not every device that you use will require firmware or BIOS updates, but most intelligent devices probably will. Okay, so what I'm about to cover is very important, so let's listen up. Since the BIOS chip and its firmware instructions are what make your PC or device run and give it the characteristics that make it unique, it's very, very important to know that installing the wrong BIOS or firmware on a device or interrupting the process while doing this update is destructive. If you load the wrong firmware update, or if your PC or other device is powered off for some reason during this update process, you may render your PC or other device useless. This is because if the BIOS firmware instructions become corrupt or are incomplete, your PC won't know what to do when you flip on the power switch. So the real message here is that you need to take extra care to make sure that these updates are performed properly. Instructions for determining which model revision and firmware level are installed on your PC or other device is almost always clearly noted in the manufacturer's website. As always, you want to compare your current version with the new download that may be available on the website to see if it's a newer version. Although it's critical that you check versions and make sure that you're covering your bases, know that these days most newer devices come with a smart installation program that checks the versions first and won't let you run updates if it's not the right one for your system. Again, this is a very similar process in almost every way to what we just did with our device driver updates in a previous section, with one huge exception, and that is that a bad firmware update could mean a dead PC or other electronic gadget. I always recommend reading any notes associated with these updates from the websites before you move forward. In some cases, you'll see that a manufacturer will list fixes and improvements included in this new firmware update. They might warn you not to update unless you're experiencing one of these specifically listed problems. As always, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. You shouldn't have to dig for them when downloading the BIOS or firmware updates. Most are clearly noted. Okay, now that I've scared everyone on the terrors of doing BIOS updates, just know that BIOS updates are very common and PC owners run them all the time. My only point is to be very careful and follow the instructions. BIOS firmware is written to be updated, and often new hardware specifications that can affect security are developed. So companies will update BIOS firmware to include them, so you should certainly take advantage of this option after you've reviewed the materials and are comfortable. So let's jump onto the Dell website again for a sample run to search for BIOS and firmware updates. As always, you would of course visit the website for your PC or device manufacturer. This is just a sample exercise. Okay, I still happen to have the Dell site up on my Internet Explorer from the last exercise, so I'm going to go back to their home page, go back to Support Drivers and Services, select Downloads and Drivers, go ahead and choose a model, I scroll down so you can see the entire screen. Of course here you would check the model that you're looking for if you had a Dell. I'm going to go ahead and say Desktops, then pick a Dimension Series Desktop, and then just randomly basically pick the 1000 series. All right, I'm going to confirm that selection and then see what software and firmware are available for that model. Okay, 
We're going to scroll down so we can see the details. As always, we're going to look at the operating system drop-down box. When I do, you'll see a couple of operating systems listed, and then you'll see BIOS listed. Now, the reason that BIOS is listed by itself here is because it's not dependent on which operating system you're running. Remember, the BIOS and the firmware run beneath the operating system. So if I'm looking for BIOS drivers, it doesn't care which operating system we're running. So I'm going to go ahead and select BIOS. I'll take a look at the results. And it looks like we have one BIOS file. So what's important to look for here, as always, is the release date and the version of the BIOS file. And then, of course, run the download, follow the instructions as we've talked about previously. This is the version A03 in this example that you compare to what's on your setup screen or your startup screen for your existing PC BIOS version. If this version is newer, you might want to install it and consider that based on the tech notes that are included with this download. That's really all there is to it. Go ahead and close out. Okay, so the final part of our discussion on BIOS and firmware updates will deal with your DSL or cable modem. Previously, we talked about your internet connection, your internet service provider, which is the company you pay for internet services, and the devices that they have on your network that connect to the internet. If your internet services are being provided by your phone company, then it's likely that you own or lease a DSL modem for access. If your services come from the cable company, then you probably have a cable modem. Another option may be using your satellite TV provider to gain access to the internet. Whichever it is, these providers will supply you with some type of modem or gateway box that resides in your home, attaches to your PC or your home network, and allows you to communicate to the outside world. These modems or gateway boxes sit on the outer edge of your home network and act as sort of a middleman between your personal home network and all the resources on it and the wide open internet. Much like a firewall sits between your PC and your network watching everything that moves in and out, your internet device also sits between your broader home network and the outside world, passing all of your traffic as well as all the traffic from the internet back and forth from your PCs. So it's pretty clear to see how your DSL cable or satellite internet box could serve as a gatekeeper between you and the outside world, which could have an effect on how secure your internal PC and network might be. These devices will also contain BIOS chips with firmware programming, which could drift out of date and begin to lack features and current security options. Therefore, it's important for any home or small business user to address this point of entry to make sure obvious gaps in your security are not present. Like many electronic gadgets, many of these devices may also provide access to them so you can perform certain configuration changes. Most likely, they allow access using your internet browser software, so if you know the IP address of the administration or management port, you can get access to them. You can see that this is beginning to delve way too far into the technical details for most PC users to be comfortable with. In general, I would not recommend that you use these administrative tools to access and make changes to your internet devices unless you are well versed in the basic networking and other technologies that are involved. Most internet providers take issue with their customers accessing these devices without the assistance of their own technical support crew. This brings us full circle back to the challenge before us. On one hand, you're taking a number of actions and investing time to make sure your PC and computing environment is secure and free of entry points for the bad guys. On the other hand, your internet company places a device, which is really a black box that you know very little about, into your home with no way for you to know that it's secured to your level of satisfaction. Here's the best workable solution. You should place a call to the support line of your internet provider and ask to speak with a specialist regarding security in your internet device. You should describe your interests in maintaining the highest level of security and express the need to take steps to configure that box to meet those high standards. Some DSL modems could be configured by you from your PC with their instructions, while some can be programmed remotely by them. Most cable modems and satellite boxes are configured remotely by the provider. Either way, you should take the time to contact them, open a ticket, and ask them what can be done to take advantage of its capability to ensure that it's locked down and has the strongest firewall type features operational. Another consideration is simply the age of the unit. These boxes come in and out of the market frequently, and as such, many of those in use today are very much out of date. These older units may certainly be vulnerable to threats, or at the very least lack the performance and available options of the newer models. If you've had your internet device in place at home for more than two to three years, you might want to speak to your provider's support team and request the latest model. 
I'm sure you already realize the last thing your service provider customer support wants to deal with is a customer who's worried about security or is asking for a newer model of their equipment, especially if the service is currently up and running. You might encounter some pushback depending on the company and level of customer support they deliver. Even so, as an educated PC user with a serious interest in maintaining security and protecting your property, you should stick with it until you're satisfied that they have accommodated your request. Don't be shy and you should quickly escalate your ticket to the service management team for best results. You're the customer, and there are multiple options out there for internet services, a very competitive industry in most parts of this country. If they're unwilling to assist you in addressing your security-minded concerns, then there's always the option of threatening to discontinue service and go with one of their competitors. Sometimes that's the only way to get attention to the appropriate level of support quickly. Okay. So I think we've done what we can on the subject of making sure your internet service device is secure. Finally, for chapter one of the moderate level, I want to run through basic networking concepts with focus on your IP network addressing, DHCP services, DNS, and a few other common functions performed by your networking equipment. As with many sections, this is primarily informational and hopefully educational. But I think in the larger scheme of things, it's important that you get a bit more background on many of these items that you hear about and read about, but may not be well versed on. Some of these certainly have security and best practice implications, so let's look under the hood. As you see in this diagram, the basic components of your home network involve your PC, the network card that's installed in it, which might be a wireless card if you're using a wireless laptop, network cabling, one or more switches, possibly a wireless network router, and an internet device connected to the outside world. Some of these devices are also providing specific services related to your networking, which I'll get to in a moment. Some networks may be very simple and contain only some of these items, while others may be more complex and may include multiple PCs, switches, and routers, and other networking gear. In both cases, though, the principles I'm going to talk about are the same. So starting with your PC, we have your network card which attaches to your home network either by a network cable or wirelessly. Every single point that touches or attaches to your network must have an address so that every other device knows how to reach it. Very much like your home address allows mail to locate your mailbox. This addressing is based on a protocol known as TCPIP, which stands for Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. I know, I'm probably getting too deep into the technology. But basically, it's the protocol that controls how the bits of information are sent and received by any network device, as well as leveraging the numbering scheme or IP address that allows everything to locate everything else. Every package of information that leaves your PC has the IP address and other TCP IP information tagged onto it, so while it's on its journey, it knows what to do and where to go. In business and on the internet, these ranges of IP addresses are owned by organizations and therefore cannot be used by others. This ensures that duplicate addresses are not used. However, since every homeowner has his own little private network in the house, there are common private address ranges that are used by many. Because these addresses are only used inside your own personal network and never go beyond, there are no conflicts related to duplicate addresses. Generally speaking, it's best practice for you to use one of these private ranges inside your home network to be consistent and follow industry standards. Most consumer-level devices, such as internet modems and wireless routers, for example, will use one of these common standards that look like this. As you add new devices onto your network, you would increment the last number on the right-hand side to assign it a new, unique address. Many wireless routers and other devices on the market for home use might use a .1 or .254 right-hand number, so it's best to use addresses in the middle of the range for other devices that you may own. Wait a minute. Maybe your home network has been working fine all along and you've done nothing at all regarding network IP addresses or assigning them to any new equipment. That's very likely your situation. That's because one of the IP services that I mentioned before automatically takes care of handing out new valid addresses to devices as they come onto your network. This service is known as DHCP or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Don't worry about the acronyms or the technical labels. Just be aware that these things are happening on your network. Very often your internet modem or your wireless router will offer this DHCP service to your network. DHCP holds a range of IP addresses in its queue. For example, 192.168.1.5 through .25. 
When a new device such as your PC is powered up and connects to your network, it will send out a request or a question to all of its fellow network devices asking if any of them is running DHCP, and if so, if they can take the next available IP address. Then the DHCP service delivers this newly active PC an address within its range and keeps a note of it so that it won't give it out to another computer. Pretty much as simple as that. Okay, so that's how your network devices get their addressing and locate each other so that they can communicate on your home network. Next, I want to quickly review how your system finds requested websites and other resources out on the global internet. On the vast internet, there's the same challenge of keeping your addressing straight as you might have at home. Every site needs its own unique address so it can be easily located. You also don't want duplicates to be assigned. This is accomplished in a similar fashion regarding IP addresses. Every website you visit has a unique IP address assigned to it. These lists have grown huge and are managed by many, many servers out on the internet known as DNS servers. DNS stands for Domain Name System. This system is managed by a very few global consortiums to ensure consistency. But what's important for you to know is that the service keeps copies of this list across the globe on DNS servers everywhere so you can find things fast. These servers are always synchronizing to keep each other up to date worldwide. So that gives us an IP address for everyone. Problem solved, right? Wrong. Because as a user of the internet, you couldn't possibly remember all the IP addresses of all the websites that you visit. So a simpler domain name scheme was created. For example, www.youtube.com. YouTube would get an IP address and then register that address along with the name www.youtube.com. This information is also stored around the globe using the IP address on these DNS servers. So when you type in www.youtube.com, your PC goes out to the nearest DNS server, looks up the address, and then finds the associated IP address and voila! sweeps you off to the desired site and connects you to YouTube. So I'm certain that you must be wondering why I'm going into all of this when we're simply trying to secure your home PC, right? There are a couple of answers to that question. First, it's important for you to understand the basics as always. Second, it's important that you follow best practice and networking rules when assigning IP addresses at home or at your small business. That way, as you expand with new gear or have problems in contact technical support, you're running a standard network scheme and can solve problems quicker. Last but not least, there are threats out there involving DNS servers. Some of the bad guys will place fake DNS servers out there so that when your PC requests an address to find a web server, the bogus DNS server returns the wrong IP address which may direct you to a fraudulent website. The whole point of understanding basic DNS function is to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. The best way to protect yourself is to make sure your PCs are configured to use DNS servers supplied by your internet service provider. These specific servers will sit on the premises of your internet service provider and are certain to be valid. Let me show you how to quickly check which DNS servers your PC is configured to use. Alright, I'm going to go to the Start button. And in the search field, I'm going to type CMD. Choose it from the list. This brings up a command line window. Like we did once or twice in previous chapters, I'm going to type in ipconfig slash all and hit enter. Then I'm going to look for a line that lists out the DNS servers currently configured for my network card. I'm going to go ahead and scroll down. And I see my DNS servers at the bottom. DNS servers 192.168.1.254. You will typically see a primary and a backup address here in case one of your DNS servers is unavailable. What you might see is a private home IP address like 192.168.1.1 or .254 for the right hand number. This is typically an IP address for a cable, DSL, or satellite modem or possibly wireless router on your network. What this means is that one of these devices on your network is providing DNS services for your system. This is probably okay as long as you're confident that your internet device is secured, something that we just covered in the last section. There is a way for you to force what you know are the valid DNS addresses into this configuration to be certain that this feature never gets hijacked and therefore you're always safe. 
That's to manually configure the DNS servers for each of your PCs or network cards. Let's run through this manual configuration so you can see what I'm referring to. Before we get started, you'll need to know the preferred and the alternate DNS server addresses used by your internet provider company. These addresses should be in your documentation or could quickly be found on their website in the support or how to configure sections. Once you have these addresses, we're ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and close the command line out. Now we're going to go down to start, control panel, network and internet, network and sharing center. Now on the left window pane, we're going to click change adapter settings. Adapter refers to your network adapter. I have two listed here, my wireless and my standard local area connection. I'm going to right mouse click on my local area connection and select properties. Here's all the properties for my particular network connection. I'm going to look for Internet Protocol version 4. I'm going to highlight it. Then I'm going to select Properties again. Here you'll see a list of the IP properties in the configuration window. There are two choices for both the IP addresses and DNS server addresses. They are Obtain Automatically or Use a Specific Address. If you see the Obtain IP Addresses Automatically radio button selected and all the IP address fields are grayed out, then you know that your PC is using some DHCP source to grab its IP address when it's powered up. If the Use the following IP address radio button is selected and you see the IP address information in the fields, then you know you're manually configured and you're not using DHCP services on your network. In either case, you should look at the bottom section and select the radio button for Use the following DNS server addresses. Then carefully key in the preferred and alternate DNS server address that are provided by your internet service provider company. So you'd come down here, you'd click use the following DNS server and enter the preferred and the alternate addresses in these fields. That means that your IP address may be obtained automatically using DHCP, but you're forcing the DNS addresses for the specific DNS servers that your provider provides to you. So what's important to remember is that if you have multiple network cards installed in this PC, and I do, I have a wireless connection as well, I'd have to make the same changes. I'll run through it real quick. Properties. TCP IP version 4. I would have to make the same changes here. So basically I'm repeating the same steps for all of the network connections that I have in this PC. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that out. Once configured, you should launch your internet browser and click around to make sure that all is well. If you're unable to connect to websites on the internet, then it's very likely that the DNS IP addresses that you entered were not correct, or you made an error when you keyed them in. Go back and review your entries and check back with your internet company tech support to make sure that you have the current and correct DNS server addresses. Once properly configured, You've now ensured that no outside person can easily redirect your DNS lookups by sending you to an invalid DNS server. Okay, well that covers all the items for Chapter 1 of the Moderate Security Level. As always, let's throw the clipboard up on the screen and do a quick review of what we've covered in this chapter. So we reviewed what device drivers are and what they do, how to check current device driver versions, and how to update device drivers from the web. We've added SSL security to email. We've reviewed what BIOS does, how to check current BIOS levels on your PC, and how to update BIOS firmware from the internet. Then we talked about how to ensure your internet device is current, meaning your cable modem, your DSL modem, or your satellite box. We've reviewed basic networking, including TCP IP, DHCP, and DNS. And finally, we've configured your DNS addressing to improve security. Okay, Chapter 1 of the Moderate Security Level is now behind us and in our rearview mirror. Next up is Moderate Level Chapter 2. See you there!